Okay, so I didn't forget, guys. You can remind me when I start to panic at the end of this, but I forgot to do it. Um, let's see here. How's everyone doing this morning? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Pretty good. Good. Okay. Guys, got any questions about uh, material science or structural optimization or anything? Anything you want to talk about before we start? No? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen here and uh, see if we can find the right one. Uh, this one. Here we go. Sure. Okay. You should be seeing that about now, right? Thumbs up. Okay. I'm going to uh, go to uh, presentation mode. There we go. So you guys should be able to see that a little bit better now. Right. Okay. Um, again, the stuff we're discussing here is um, very material sciencey. We'll be discussing this for like this lecture and the next one and maybe the one after that, depending on how far we get. And um, for those of you who are more sort of structures and mechanical, you know, interested in those type of things and you're oriented and looking at, you know, space frames and airplane fuselages and things like that. Um, I ask for your patience. We'll get to that um, in the next couple lectures, but uh, we have to establish the material side of the equation before we can move to the geometry side of the equation. So we're gonna discuss this just a little bit longer. Ask for your patience. I think this is, to me, this is really interesting stuff too. Um, I don't know of you guys, but uh, to me, this is great. Anyway, so um, we have been talking about the processing structure um, property uh, relationships in materials systems. We talked about how those systems can be thought of having subsystems, the processes, there's different processes, there's different substructures that go into the overall structure of the material. There's a hierarchy of different structures that interact with one another. And these interactions between the, between the um, microstructural subsystems and and within each other and in and of themselves and outside um, loading conditions or outside forces and stresses result in materials that uh, can be engineered, designed, not just chosen from a catalog, but designed to have a strong uh, yield strength, a high yield strength and a, and, and a high yield strength to density ratio. When you ha can have a high strength to density ratio, that is when you can design the most efficient structures. That's when you have the highest potential to use all the the geometri geometrical tools we'll discuss in a few lectures um, to make the lightest, strongest, stiffest structures. Okay, that's the foundation of this. Any questions, guys, on this? No? Okay. We talked about heat treating steel last time. Um, for those of you who are, who are not material science majors, um, I just wanted to include this so we're all on the same page. But in, in summary, you have a piece of steel. Maybe you got it straight from the steel mill. You can um, heat this material up to solution treat it or turn it to austenite. You're going from a body center cubic atomic structure to a face center uh, cubic atomic structure. This material can then be quenched at a high rate, high rate of heat extraction to become a, a very different material than it started as. So it will go from being um, this face center cubic material. You quench it quick enough and you get what's called martensite, which is a body center to tragonal material. It, typically, it can be some other forms. It can be HCP2, actually, I learned. Um, and then this, this martensitic material is oftentimes too brittle to be used in structural applications. If you made a bicycle out of pure martensitic steel that hadn't been tempered, you could hit a bump and the chain stay or some other tube might snap, and then you'd be in trouble. The, um, the tempering stage is, is very important. Um, typically, when you temper, for like a low carbon inexpensive steel, you'll get tempered martensite. So you, the martensite are sort of these, these sort of needle-like structures and they'll, they'll grow a little bit. So they're a little bit less coarse or a little bit more coarse and a little bit more um, pliable, let's say. It's a little bit easier to get a crack or a dislocation through there. So then the material is tougher. You might lose a little bit of strength, but you'll gain enough toughness or energy absorption capability that you can then use this material in a practical application. In some steels, some steels that have lots of alloy content in them, lots of chrome or mall or nickel or whatever, uh, you can actually do what's called precipitation hardening. And we discussed precipitation hardening in a previous lecture, kind of under the context of aluminum where you, you precipitate out these little particles and the little particles are um, some, in case of steel, they might be some type of uh, carbide, so type the metal carbide and aluminum, sometimes there's some type of uh, aluminum silicide or magnesium silicide 
And these little particles can stop dislocations from moving through your lattice of material, which is strengthening. That's what strengthening really is. Uh, these little materials, these little particles can be either what we call coherent or incoherent. The coherent means that they, the atomic planes line up with the atomic planes of the matrix material, the, the host material, the sol vent. So the solute, which is the little particle, the chemistry of the little particle, um, the, the, when it forms this little precipitate, the, the atomic structures, the lattice lines, they line up. Um, that's, that's, the, that's opposed to incoherent, where the, you have a little particle, but it doesn't line up with anything, and it's not really well adhered to the material around it. <clears throat> um, as, you, as you heat materials, these little particles grow, 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 grow. Uh, if they're initially coherent, as they grow to a certain size, they will become incoherent. And as they become incoherent, the material is not as strong as it once had been. So you can, you can over um, age a material so that it doesn't have strength and it loses strength in a bad way. And I told you the story about how I once was responsible for an aluminum electric motor housing and that the, uh, the, the company that was inserting the, um, <clears throat> the rotor uh, made from high silicon steel laminate materials and wires and magnets and so forth, when they dropped that into the the heat up, they would, they would try to get that into the, uh, the motor housing by heating up the motor housing so it would expand from thermal expansion. And their line workers weren't aware that if you left that thing hot too long, it would get weak and fail. And this is exactly what happened to um, some of our test motors. They failed because the metals, the precipitates had been coarsened. They went from uh, coherent to incoherent. The material failed. People got pretty upset. The mechanical engineers couldn't figure it out. And then they had to call a material scientist and we figured it out. <clears throat> We talked about this thermodynamic force called driving force. Driving force, it's kind of an, an abstract topic. You probably won't become an expert in this. It's kind of, kind of a weird thing to put your finger on, but you can kind of think of it as the force, the, the thermodynamic, um, let's say the, the drop, you know, systems are always trying to minimize their, their energy. So it's sort of the drop in energy as you form this little precipitate. And the higher the driving force, to form these precipitates, the more likely they are to, to, grow, to nucleate or, or, or start as little tiny, you know, just a couple atoms across maybe, maybe a couple hundred atoms across, little tiny particles that are, that are coherent. And, and, then, and then not just that, not only are they small, but there's, they're very well dispersed throughout the whole piece of material. So we talked about the, the bread uh, with the raisins in it, the raisin breads. We talked about the bread with the dates in it. And this is, this would be, you're, you're, you're aiming for a piece of bread with a lot of really small raisins, really well distributed throughout the material. And if, and this is, this is, this is the stronger up, um, possibility. You're, you're trying to avoid the situation where you've got big, ugly dates in there that aren't really attached to the, the, the matrix or the solvent material. And they, and they, and they, they don't adhere very well. So we showed you these, these graphs here. These are topological graphs that show how uh, driving force changes with the uh, addition of chromium and molybdenum in this um, AF1410 uh, alloy. This alloy again was de developed by the, um, by the Air Force to be used in landing gear on airplanes, which is a very high stress application. And uh, we, we showed that you want to avoid these incoherent, these M6C carbides, and you want to promote the growth of these M2C carbides and so we, we found a place in both of these two driving force or design spaces. So this is a two variable, a two variable design space. That is the amount of chromium and the amount of molybdenum. Uh, we found a place where we could not go um, above a certain or below a certain value um, for the unwanted chromium, but stay above a, as high as possible for the, for the wanted, sorry, not carbon, precipitate, for the wanted coherent precipitate we found that optimum space and that gave us a composition that gave us this composition right here. This about one and a third or one and a quarter percent molybdenum and one and a third or one and a quarter percent, or I'm sorry, two and a third and two and a quarter percent chromium. We found this to be the optimum location to, to precipitate out the, the much wanted, the desirable, fine dispersion of little tiny coherent precipitates very finely distributed throughout this, this, uh, this bulk of material. And uh, this, is, this is designing a material. We have, we have uh, identified a design space. The design space is how much chromium, how much molybdenum, 
we found the great place, the optimum place within that design space that is going to give us the microstructure, the fine precipitates that we want. And we want these fine precipitates because they are most likely to give us the highest strength. And that's where we finished off on the last lecture. So did everybody get this? It's a, maybe for non-material science majors, it's a little, it's a little weird, a little, a little strange, a um, little abstract. Anyone want to talk about it? Anyone? Nick, you're smiling. It's a little bit hard to follow, but, um, but I think I get the general gist. Let me help you out. What is it? We have, I want to stop today before we get into design for stiffness. So we probably have a little bit extra time. So if there's any specific questions, feel free to ask. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I think, <laughs> I, think I just need more time uh, staring at the graph and uh, okay. knowing what specific numbers mean. Okay, these, these graphs the graph, are... The graph indicates basically the sweet spot where you want to be between the two properties when designing a material. Is, is, is that fair? Is that, that's is fair. That, that's a good high-level description of it. Mm -hmm. Digging down a little bit further, though, these are topological graphs. They're like mountains, okay? And driving mm -hmm. force, you want to maximize driving force of the, of the coherent, the one of the blue graph here, the blue lines. You want to maximize mm -hmm. the driving force so that when you have a really high driving force, it's thermodynamically favorable to precipitate out the little tiny coherent precipitates that you're looking for that will give you the mm -hmm. highest strength. And you want to discourage the M6C incoherent carbides. And so the, the mountain is going uphill as you move from the um, left, the upper left to the lower right on both of these graphs. Mm -hmm. So the driving force is high down here, it's low down here. In this design space, the two variables are the amount of chromium, the amount of molybdenum. You want to choose, you want to choose the amount of molybdenum and the amount of chromium. You want to pick those two variables in the design space that will effectively um, maximize the driving force for the M2C carbides. And that happens to be right here where the driving force is 19 kilojoules per mole right here. But you know that um, these two sort of go hand in hand. As you, as you increase the amount of molybdenum, for example, and decrease the amount of chromium, um, in both cases, the driving force goes up. So if you just say, okay, well, I'll just stick some amount of chromium in there and I'll keep adding molybdenum, you'll get in trouble because you'll continue to also increase the driving force for the uh, M6C carbides, the incoherent carbides. So what you do is you say, okay, I know from experiment that once the driving force gets above 15 kilojoules per mole, right here, I know that things go haywire. So I'm gonna say, if I fix, if I fix the driving force and the composition that gives me the driving force of 15 kilojoules per mole, oops, sorry, if I fix that, what is the highest I can go without going to the right of that green line? What's the highest I can go in this design space that will give me the highest driving force for the M2C carbide. So the, the highest point on this blue mountain over here, what's the, what's mm -hmm. the furthest I can go? And as you, as you, so you have to stay to the, you have to stay to the left of this green line. Did I say that wrong before? You have to stay to the left of this green line. If I'm, if I'm up here, say where my cursor is, then I'm really like at 17 and a half kilojoules per mole. But I can do better than that. I can move down this curve in composition Okay, I can decrease the amount of chromium, I can decrease the amount of chromium, uh, uh, molybdenum, and I can get down to right here, where it says 19 kilojoules per mole. That's this contour right here. Remember, these are constant uh, driving force contours. If I go past this point, the curve starts to curve back to the right. See that? So if I go mm -hmm. further down in chromium composition, or if I go up in molybdenum composition, I'll go around this corner and I'll end up with actually a, uh, a lower driving force. I'll be back into like this, this 18 and a half. I'll be over here somewhere. So like right here. So that composition would have a lower driving force to form these M2C carbides, the things you want. Yeah, yeah, that helps me see uh, exactly what we're optimizing for here. Thank you. Don't worry, I've, um, I've probably um, read this about 15 times to understand it. When, when, in the great. actual um, article this came out of. Mm -hmm. Hi, Don. Can you, can you hear? Yeah, what's up? Um, yeah, um, building on that question, like what you said made sense, but how, um, 
why did we pick the green line uh, equals to 15 uh, in the first place and not 14 or 16? I'm sorry, I, I might have missed sure. that last. Sure last question. No, the, so the, the steel research group at Northwestern University back in, I think the, uh, was it the 90s? 1991, they looked at different compositions along this yellow line here. See the yellow line, the dashed yellow line? They, they, they took a variety of different compositions along this line and then they did mechanical testing. And they found that when, when, the, um, when the driving force for the um, M6C carbides got above this 15, they saw a dramatic drop off in mechanical properties. The material got weak. So apparently, and I've read the paper, there was a there was a big drop off in properties as you got past this 15. So they pegged it. They said, we're not going to go past the composition can't have a, uh, a composition that leads us to a driving force of greater than this 15 kilojoules per mole. And that's why they picked that line. Okay, so they fixed it there. They said, we got to stay, we got to stay to the right, sorry, to the left. We have to stay to the left of this line. We have to stay to the left of this line. And we want to maximize the molybdenum. So that puts us right here, which is at the nose of that 19 kilojoule per mole line, the blue line here for the molybdenum or for the M2C carbide. Make yeah, sense? That makes perfect sense now. Thank you. Okay. Does the dotted yellow line have any other significance beyond just the set of conditions that they tested? No, for, no it's just, uh, it's just an experimental result. They, okay. they tried multiple different compositions along this yellow line. And that's, that's what they did. They, have, they, they, they collected data along this line and then took mechanical property measurements. Cool. So hardness sense, measurements. Are, sorry, what? It's just saying that all makes, all makes a lot of sense now. Okay, good, good. Glad it makes sense because it's kind of a, it takes a while to really wrap your head around this. That, um, you know, so like hardness tests, for example, are very quick. You can, you can take a hardness test in two seconds and get good data from it. And so they probably, they, they did a lot of hard, hardness testing there to get this information. And um, similarly, they, they came up with this, this graph here, okay? By the way, the, the, um, when I use the citations at the bottom to cite where this information came from, um, those are, that's the article that I read from which I learned the information. So it may not be the first time the information was published, just saying. So this, this is an interesting set of graphs right here. This is, um, this is tempering time, okay? This is tempering time for an alloy, for an AF1410 steel. So, okay, so this, is, this, is, this material has been solution treated, it's been quenched, then it's been tempered. They've, they've heated it up for some period of time. And because this AF1410 alloy has a lot of alloy content, it does, like I said before, it does form these precipitates. And so here is a graph of how different parameters of these precipitates change with this tempering time, okay? So as you go up, you're increasing the amount of tempering time. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wait a second, five, one, two, three, four, five. I've got six different graphs here that show how different parameters of the material and of these precipitates changed. And what, what I want you to, don't get, don't get too down in the details here, but what I want you to see here is that there is this really um, hard link between the microstructure, the microstructure being the precipitate, precipitate. There's this hard link here between these precipitates and the strength of this material. The strength is given by this, this Rockwell hardness right here. This, um, this is in the sea level because it's pretty strong material. So with tempering time, the precipitate size increases. Okay, you see that because the graph is going from the lower left to the upper right. So with time and tempering, the precipitates are getting bigger. Okay, no surprise there. What's also changing is the aspect ratio. And I don't want to get into too much detail about how they define that, but these precipitates aren't always round. I've kind of told you they're round just to be, you know, to sort of give an idealized view that's easier to understand. But the, the fact is, is that they can as you increase in temperature, sometimes these precipitates can grow into, into rods or little platelets. They're not necessarily little round spheres. And as you increase temperature in this, with this system, again, the, the aspect ratio of these 
precipitates is changing. So they're going from being round to being sort of elongated, elongated little rods. Also, the, the number, the number as you increase the number of particles initially goes up, but then as you get too much time into this, too much heat, they actually begin to decrease in number. And this is a, this is a process called Oswald ripening. You guys ever heard this, this term before, Oswald ripening? So sometimes economists use this to, um, they, they use this principle of material scientists called Oswald ripening to describe the, what happens to big and, big and large and small and little companies with, with time. And basically what it says is that the bigger get bigger and the smaller die off and go away. <laughs> so um, as you have a little, as you have these precipitates grow, as you spend more and more time adding time and temperature, um, adding more and more energy into this material, the particles grow, grow, grow. And as they're growing, they start sucking away alloy content from the smaller ones. So the smaller ones disappear and the bigger ones get bigger. It's called Oswald ripening. And there actually, when I was, um, there's, a, there's a gravity term in the equation. And it's interesting because when I was a grad student, one of the groups in my department actually launched a, um, an experiment up in the space shuttle at the time. I guess I'm dating myself again. But they, they launched a, 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 an experiment up in the space shuttle where they did Oswald ripening in zero gravity or microgravity. And they found that it actually behaved differently than it did on the Earth. So that's, that's especially interesting when you start considering how popular like, you know, space travel, how much we're seeing an uptick in, in space travel activity. Um, without getting too far off in a tangent, um, you know, we've had an interesting time in space travel. We've got private space companies, you know, we've got if any of you saw the movie Moonraker, the James Bond movie Moonraker, we've got Drax. <laughs> you could say Elon Musk is Drax. Anyway, just kidding. Um, but anyway, now we've got we've got Elon Musk and SpaceX, and we've got we've got uh, Blue Origin uh, from Jeff Bezos, and we've got Virgin Galactic from um, Richard Branson, um, and you know, and then the traditional uh, more space companies like Lockheed and Boeing. But the point is, is that you're seeing a lot more activity in space vehicles. We're building a lot more space vehicles now than we had in the past, and it this issue of how do these particles coarsen when in, in zero gravity and there's a lot of temperature, a lot of heat, this is going to become a more relevant topic, I think, as we spend, have our spaceships or spacecraft spend more time in outer space. Okay, moving on here. Um, volume fraction. The volume fraction um, with temperature and time also goes up. The lattice parameter goes up. And this is this is the, the lattice parameter is the distance between the atoms. That's the lattice parameter. And as that number goes up, you lose coherency. So above this temperature that I've got with the lower dotted line right here, the material loses coherency. And then I don't wanna to get too far into this, but the composition, the um, favorability of a different M2C carbide to form. So again, the, I probably didn't mention this. The M is a metal, the C is carbon. And M2C, metal to two metals to a carbon. The, uh, the preference for which, which material gets that M changes as you increase in temperature and time, uh, or sorry, increase in time with, at, the, at, a, at a constant temperature, in this case, 510 degrees C. And you can see that as these, all these parameters here are changing, the hardness of the material is actually going down, it's decreasing. So um, what I'm, again, what I'm trying to prove here, what I'm trying to show here is that there is, there is this understanding, this, this relationship between these different microstructural parameters that define these precipitates, the size of them, the number of them, the aspect ratio, the volume fraction, the, the lattice parameter within these, within these um, precipitates. As those numbers change, so does the strength. And we can use this later to try to predict based on looking at a micrograph of the material saying, okay, I expect the strength to be this based on what I'm looking at, based on the data that you're seeing in this graph right here. Any questions on this, guys? Anyone? Okay, moving on to the next graph. So this information right here, the, this data was all collected pretty much by hand. So probably some poor grad student worked for like 10 years to figure all this out and put all this data into a graph or these graphs, these six graphs. This will, a lot of experimental data here. This, this must have been brutal. There's a lot of time spent looking in transmission electron microscopes and doing hardness tests and doing x-ray diffraction experiments to figure out how the atoms are spreading. So this is a lot of work, right? This probably took years and years and years of some poor suffering of, of a grad student or a couple of grad students. Uh, whereas now 
the, um, the thermodynamic modeling of these phenomena, these, these changes in precipitate size and volume fraction in aspect ratio, we have very good model is, models right now that are able to use thermodynamic equations to figure out what these different parameters look like as far as size with, with tempering temperature or aspect ratio um, or number density. We have tools right now that we can do all this stuff virtually. We don't have to sit there and, and heat up a bunch of materials and stick furnaces and x-ray diffraction machines and spending all this time putting all this together in all these different experimental setups, which are very, very, very labor intensive, make grad students go crazy, really crazy. So um, I'm speaking from experience here. You can probably tell. Um, the, the, the point is it's so much easier now. We have these thermodynamic tools. Thermocal is available in the Department of Material Science. I'm sure if um, any of you were interested to try playing with this, you could, you could download a student version of Thermocal onto your computer. Uh, you could talk to my friend Clay Hauser in the material science department, and I'm sure he could set you up with an account. You can go into these different, different. Um, you can go into thermocalc and you can play with some of these different alloy compositions to see how these materials change. But here's the real, here's some real data, some real information um, that was taken off of thermocalc. So these graphs are lifted from thermocalc, and this is for a nickel-based super alloy, and it's showing how with heat treatment time, that's the bottom axis here, how the mean radius of the precipitates in this nickel-based uh, super alloy change with temperature. It shows how the, uh, the number density changes with, I'm sorry, not with temperature, with time. It shows how the number density is changing with time. It shows how the distribution in different sizes, how many particles of different sizes is changing with this tempering time. Okay, so um, yeah, so, the, so these are each one of these histograms here. This is a histogram of size um, uh, number per, per the size uh, of the precipitate. Um, each of these is for a different tempering time, 27 hours, um, 192 hours, 60, 624 hours, 1,251 hours. These are, this is how the, the distribution is changing. So this is, this is all very useful. If you're, if you're an engineer, a materials engineer, and you're trying to specify a heat treatment, Maybe it's for an existing material. Maybe it's for an absolutely new material. You don't have to sit there and run all these experiments. You can pick up a program like Thermocal and you can run all these experiments virtually. And you can, you can get a, a fairly accurate picture of how these precipitates that you're relying on to provide maximum strengthening in the material, how these are all changing with tempering time. And you can also, you can, in Thermocal, you can also adjust the temperature. So you can study time and temperature you know, together, you don't have to just have one of them. It's, it's an amazing tool. It's, um, you know, this is, um, this w requires so much experimental time to do all this by hand experimentally that, that understanding how these different material systems behave with time and temperature, how the particles would change with time and temperature. This wasn't possible like 20 years ago. So this capability, this ability to, to understand how the precipitate population is changing, how these different parameters of the, of the precipitates is changing with time and temperature. This opens up a whole new design space, a whole new world of possibilities to design new materials that, that material scientists really didn't have 20 years ago, or, or maybe not even 15 years ago. So it's exciting stuff. Thermocalc can also tell you um, at a given, um, for a given composition, how these phases are changing in terms of how much is there. So here is a graph that shows the fraction percent, guys, the fraction percent um, of these precipitates versus temperature, okay? And it shows that these different temperature, how these different, as you're heating up this material, how these different phases will appear, disappear, and reappear. So in, in the simplest terms, you can see right here, there's this um, sort of ultramarine blue line right here. It's, it's, labeled number four. This is the liquidus. This is when the material becomes liquid. So you can see that at this temperature, which is about, I don't know, 1475 C maybe, that, that all of a sudden all the solid material disappears and the fraction of liquid increases very rapidly as this material is melting until when you get above this 1475 or whatever it is, that's, that's all you have is liquid. That's sort of the simple look at this, but looking more complicated, you can also see 
uh, and more complicated issues, you can also see how the different phases, uh, the different precipitates are forming in the material with this increase in temperature. Okay, again, if you can, if you can decide, I want to grow, um, I want to grow this, this number five here, I want to grow this M23 C6 carbide, because I happen to know that this is good at strengthening the material. If I want to preferentially grow this, this precipitate, I can heat this material to 800 degrees, give it a couple minutes or hour or whatever for these particles to precipitate out, then I can quench this material and I can lock in that population of those M23 C6 uh, materials, precipitates. And that's, and that's how you use thermocalc as a design tool, by knowing what forms at what temperature and also perhaps time as well, and, and then lock that in through this quenching maneuver that material scientists have relied on for eons. So this is a way, again, you use thermocalc to design a material. You're designing the heat treating system in this case. Up here, up here, we were designing the composition. What atoms are we gonna put in there? Down here and here, we're, we're, we're designing the heat treatment. We're designing the heat treatment to figure out how to get the right microstructure to give us the maximum strength. Okay, see some head shaking. Any questions on this? Go ahead. Eliminate. Well, I almost asked a question about Invar like three, uh three lectures ago and then decided to wait until I saw more. This is exactly the kind of thing that I was uh, looking okay. to learn about because we have some really complicated um, heat treatment processes that we go through to get what we want out of it. And okay. I was wondering how they come upon those. And, so what, what uh, are you really about interesting. It? What, what are, are you, is it just all about the thermal expansion coefficient? Is there anything else there? Uh, it's mostly about thermal expansion uh, coefficient. And some of it has to do with uh, stress relieving after um, after initial machining, so that it doesn't change over time. Because mm. um, yeah, temporal stability right. is also really important for something going up into space, not coming down for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, I, sometime I'll take a look at the uh, the heat treatment again and maybe ask you uh, yeah, why they do specific steps. It. Yeah, really cool. is, this is this is exactly what you're doing there. I'm, I'm not an expert on the, you know, exactly on the metallurgy of that material. And, and I can I can go to the library and I can find papers. I don't even have to go there anymore. Just look it up. Right. I can download a PDF now. It's a beautiful thing. Um, uh, I can I can learn about the microstructure. I can learn about the different phases that are that are present in this Invar material. And then I can go to thermocalc and I can I can I can put in the composition. And I can put in temperature and time. And I can figure out exactly what heat treatment is going to give me the different phases. It might be that phase 17 has the lowest thermal expansion coefficient. And then I can engineer the composition. I can tweak the nickel concentration a little bit, for example, to ensure that after I heat treat, I'm still stuck with that phase number 17. And, that, and, that, and that's really the designability here. Now, we talked before about machining this material. Now, what if, what if you could put a little bit of lead in there or a little bit of sulfur? Right, not you don't you know you want to get typically for increasing machinability, you want to form these little manganese um, sulfur stringers they call them, and the higher the aspect ratio, right? We talked about aspect ratio up here, mm -hmm. uh, right here. The higher the aspect ratio, the more machinable it is. So you want these little these little stringers that kind of go long and skinny because that increases the machinability. And and using thermocal. You could, you could potentially do this. You could figure out how do I, what thermodynamic process, what composition am I gonna to have to use in order to maximize that aspect ratio, that aspect ratio so that I can maximize the machine ability of this material. Okay, so I've, I've been involved in the past with um, a company where they, they use this, what is it? 14L12, I think it's called, or 12L14. This is a steel where they add, they resulfurize. They put more sulfur in there to increase the machine ability. Now, from a, from a fatigue performance and a mechanical properties, uh, strength performance, it's suicide. Don't ever do that. Don't ever use that material in a structural application. But if all your machining is light fixtures for the outside of your house or barn doors or, or metal gates for your garden, it's beautiful. 
you can you can you can find this material that has all this disgusting sulfur in it, and it's wonderful to machine. Just don't use it in a structural application where your you know people's lives are relying on, like in an airplane or a bicycle. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay, we should we should maybe talk about this offline at some point because there might be an interesting mm -hmm. project here. I'm sure I'm sure this is something you could do as your class project that uh, Professor Eager would love to see. Yep, we'll definitely be talking about it. So here's a here's a little experiment that I came up with the other day to show you another example of how heat treats are designed using thermocal. This is um so 4130 is a very common chrome moly in the structural space. Uh, there's a lot of great bicycles made from 4130 chrome moly. Yeah, there's airplane frames made out of 41 chrome moly, like some of these um, you know, some of these biplanes they used to make a long time ago. Some of the stunt planes they make now have 4130 space frame. Uh, uh, space frame structures. Um, the alloy has been used to make uh, canisters for high altitude alpine climbers so they can store as much oxygen in as low weight of vessel as possible. Uh, it's a very common alloy in the structural side of things for, for high performance applications. But um, suppose for a second that I wanted to make a 4130 steel that was castable. I wanted to cast out little brackets or something out of this material because it was too difficult to machine. So knowing from experience that silicon can dramatically increase the fluidity of molten steels, um, I might want to add a little bit of silicon in there so that I can uh, make the material more castable when it's molten. But um, I don't know what that does to the solution tree temperature of the material. I don't know what it does to the austenite. You know, same thing. I don't know how austenite is going to form. So what I did here is I did a little experiment in thermocalc just to show you how this works. And I created these four phase diagrams. And these are, these are phase diagrams for a steel system, for 4130 steel system. And the um, percent carbon is shown on the bottom axis and the temperature is on the vertical axis. And I've, for this particular material, I'm fixing the, um, the carbon content at, at about 0.3 uh, mass percent, right here where this black dotted line is. And if I wanted to, after I cast out my little brackets out of this, this castable 4130, um, I wanted to solution treat, quench, and temper this material. But if I use the um, quench temp or the solution treating temperature that, that's always been used for this material, like around 800 degrees Celsius, um, then I would be in trouble because I wouldn't get hot enough at that point to, to turn the material to austenite, to turn it from BCC to FCC to fully solution treat it. And if I just gave this to my heat treater, he'd really screw it up because he would or she wouldn't know that that, that was the austenizing temperature. Um, so what I've done here in order to make things clear for a, you know, a would-be potential heat treater in the future is I've drawn out these four um, phase diagrams of increasing silicon concentration, going from 0.2 weight percent, one weight percent, two weight percent, three weight percent, and you can see there's this line right here. I think it's actually green, although it's hard to see here, like a dark green. This line right here, hopefully you can see my cursor. That is the temperature line above which you have to get in order to turn this material into austenite, to get into the austenizing field. So you can see that as I'm adding silicon, this curve is moving to the right until it almost loops around like this. You guys see that? How it's moving as I go across the, go across the phase diagram? Here you go, here you go. Um, that allows me to figure out what the correct solution treating temperature should be. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. I would be in the dark. I would, if I didn't have thermocalc, I would have to sit there and heat treat this thing and quench it and add some more silicon, heat treat it, quench it. I have to go through four heats of material to figure this out. It would take months. But here, I did these, therm I did these, uh, these phase diagrams. I must have punched this out in 10 minutes. And I'm not even very good with thermocalc. So, it shows you, the, it shows you the, the, the power of this tool and how you can really design this heat treat system. Right, now that we've, I've shown you a couple examples of, of how you can use thermocalc to fill in this process to structure link. All right, and quite honestly, the, the problem with, with trying to teach um, this, type of, this type of information, this lesson, this, this integrated, computational materials engineering to other people is that it's very, it's very PC. It's very PC. It's not, it isn't sort of this grand algorithm you can follow, you know, do steps one through 57 and you'll get what you want. It's, it's always a case here of 
of showing examples of how the tool's been used. And that's kind of annoying because it's hard to learn from just examples alone with no sort of background algorithm of this is what you do in order to get what you want. And this is, so if, if you guys are kind of scratching your head a little bit still on how, how you use this tool, how you use ICME in order to design a material, you're not alone, okay? These, these, there's just these examples that you can show. And in order to maybe really understand, really understand how you use ICMA tools to design a material that meets your property objectives or goals, um, you have to really roll up your sleeves and dig in and try it yourself. So uh, Professor Olson, Greg Olson, um, has a class that they teach at MIT. He's teaching it actually right now. Maybe you can register for it next semester, but but he has a class where he will go through um, a design process with his students. So the students will either come up with an idea of their own or he'll probably provide some, some uh, options to pick of different material systems you can investigate. And then he'll, he will spend a semester teaching you how to use these tools to design these materials, to go through the ICME process. And this is, this is, this is in my opinion, very interesting when I, when I was a graduate student, I actually took his course and I, I did this. It's not, I think I designed a, some type of um, stainless steel for bearing applications, I think is what it was. But um, so I learned from him through, through doing this, through going through these, this process. I don't have the number of his class. I should probably have had that already for it to give to you, but I'll, I can give that to you in the next lecture if you're interested in taking it next semester. But if this sort of thing turns you on, it's a great class to take. And he, Professor Olson, as I will describe in a couple slides here is, is world renowned for ICME. He is the man. He's, he is one of the guys the entire world puts up as an example of success in ICME. And now he's at MIT. He used to be at Northwestern. So um, knowing how these different process subsystems lead to different material subsystems, the ones we might want to strengthen, we can now draw links, these lines, between these various these various processes, these various subsystems of the process system um, to identify which of, these, um, which of these processes lead to these different materials. These, are, these lines here are really drawing the causal links between the tempering or between the, the process sub, sub step or, or sub process or subsystem to the material subsystem. And you can go through this on your own. We're, we're getting just about a time, we only have five more minutes. But um, you know, alloying composition, by choosing, as I told you before, you can choose different atoms to cause substitutional strengthening. And depending on which atom, which solvent or which solute atom you choose to alloy the solvent with, you can end up with, uh, you can end up with substitutional strengthening or inter interstitial solution strengthening. So the link between, that's this link here between alloy content and which type of substitutional strengthening you get. You get. You would choose this in order to define this this link right here. Um, another example here might be the the tempering process. As you're tempering, you're changing how the precipitate population might look in this material. That's defining this link right here. Okay. So I want you to I want you to try to become comfortable with this idea of drawing the links on this type of diagram between the process system uh, and the microstructure systems. Okay. That should be something you should be comfortable with at this point, I hope. We're getting there at least. Um, okay. The next link in the chain is how do you go from microstructure to properties? Okay. And here is a, um, you know, so you, you've got these, you've made your microstructure. You've engineered your process of the material to, to, to come up with this microstructure. You can look at this microstructure either in an optical microscope or you can you're lucky you've got a transmission electron microscope or maybe you've got a scanning electron microscope and you can prepare metallurgical samples and you can confirm yes this is a microstructure i have you can go in there with 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 digital tools and measure out grain sizes and precipitate size with um, x-ray diffraction you might be able to figure out if they're coherent or incoherent or the lattice parameter you can you can confirm all the structures there but once you've got that structure once you've got that structure in place then how how in the heck do you say oh, I've got this grain size, or oh, I've got this precipitate size. Here's the exact strength. I can expect this material to have a yield strength of a gigapascal. How do you do that, okay? How do you do that? And this is, this is, this is the second link in the ICME chain, Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. It's the second link in that fundamental paradigm of material science, the, 
process structure property relations. Um, let's see here. I will do this one example and then we're probably out of time. Composite materials. Um, as a cyclist, I love composite materials. As a race car enthusiast, I love composite materials because they have incredible strength to density ratios. I'm sure Steve loves them too. Um, <laughs> uh, if I can them. What? If I can afford them. You'll be fine. <laughs> um, it turns out there's a, a nice little, very simple model you can use in order to create that or fill in that uh, structure to strength link, strength or uh, structure to, pro to property link. Um, that's for composites, that's called the law of mixtures. And it's given by this equation here. It says that the strength sigma of the composite is equal to the strength of the reinforcing phase, the fiber in this, in this case, if it was carbon fiber reinforced epo ep ep epoxy times the volume fraction. That's how much, how much fiber you got in the epoxy plus um, the strength of the matrix, in this case, epoxy times the volume fraction of epoxy. So um, if I were to lay up some carbon fiber in my garage, which I've done at times, and um, measure out the volume fraction, the best I've ever been able to achieve is about 40%, 40 volume percent of carbon fiber per epoxy. So that means for every 10 units of volume, I've got four units of those that are carbon fiber and maybe about six that are epoxy. So this is, this is about the best I can achieve by hand using a vacuum bag in my garage. You can probably do a little bit better than this when you start using autoclave, okay? So heat and pressure. Um, I can't afford an autoclave, unfortunately. Aerospace companies have those, race car companies have those, bicycle manufacturers have those. Um, if, um, if you're Boeing, Boeing actually has achieved much higher than this. Boeing has achieved volume fractions like up in like the 70 volume fraction percent. I, I, once, I once worked with a guy at Chrysler who was a former Boeing engineer and he had worked on composite materials for the Boeing 787 before, it was, before, the, before that airplane became a reality. And he once showed me a little piece of a stringer that he had cut out. I wish I had stolen it from him. But this little was a little cube of carbon fiber. And it wasn't black. It was sort of this weird blackish copper color. And, and when you touched it, it got cold really quickly. It almost felt like a metal, but it was a carbon fiber epoxy composite. And there was so much carbon fiber in there that it didn't feel like a plastic. It was the weirdest thing. I, I wish I had a chunk to show you guys. Um, really impressive stuff. The, um, the stiffness of, or the strength of carbon fiber is, is bazonkers, crazy high. They're in, carbon fibers are incredibly strong. The, the strength in tensile of a carbon fiber is like three and a half gigapascals. That's amazing. Like really high strength steels, maybe you can hit two gigapascals. More common strength of a steel, like an alloy steel, like a 4340 or 4130 steel, maybe you hit a gigapascal, maybe, maybe 1.5 gigapascals. Carbon fiber, not even a really high expensive carbon fiber, like a Torre T300, has a strength of about three and a half gigapascals. It's just astoundingly high. The strength of epoxy, not so high. It's only about 50 megapascals. But when you combine the two together, the magic happens. And you can make a material at low density that has a strength of 1.4 gigapascals. So 1,400 megapascals. Uh, so all I've done here, there's nothing, there's nothing too fancy. All I've done is I've plugged in these, these numbers for strength into this equation up here, this law of mixture equation, and I've come up with the strength for the composite, right? And this is, this is a, this is very simple, okay? But this is a real example of where I've gone from, from a microstructure, okay? So fibers and epoxy to a strength, okay? It's, it's infantile, right? This is parochial. There's nothing too advanced here. You know, my, my daughter's probably at the point where she can make this calculation. Uh, but, but, but theoretically, philosophically, we've, we've filled in that link. We've filled in that link between the structure and the property link. Okay. Um, we're out of time right now. Um, so I'm going to have to stop labbing. But next week, we'll talk about aluminum oxide fibers and aluminum and some personal experiences I've had with making these composites. So that's where we're going to stop today. Uh, any questions? Nope. We're good. Thank you, Don. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank if you, you guys Don. have any questions you come with, feel free to email me, okay? Great. Thanks, Don. Okay. Cheers.